Hello, my name is Atze de Vrieze. I'm the creator of a podcast called Weird Hit Wonder, and I'm this week's guest on Metapod. You're listening to Metapod, where we unpack the web's most interesting podcasts and the stories behind them, hosted by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May. You think there's a difference between one-hit wonders and weird one-hit wonders? Yeah. W- weird wonders. Weird wonders. Don't say it without your teeth in. Um, no, only because some one-hit wonders are actually quite good. So, do you have a favourite one-hit wonder? I do have a favourite one-hit wonder. Tell me. It's uh, Pump Up the Volume by Mars, with Ooh. two R's. Music aficionados are probably going to say, well, Mars actually had other songs, but um, I think they're well known for having that one song and it was a one hit wonder. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. I I think mine, I think mine's Easy Lover by Philip Bailey and Phil Collins. Or wait, maybe it's Supersonic by JJ Fad. Do you know that one? I, I know the former, the easy lover one i don't know the latter i'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing well you can look it up later okay which Um, does bring us nicely to our guest i guess this week's guest is really obsessed with weird and rare hits the kind that you love after forgetting about them for years and then hear them again but as he says songs that you might not want to play at your funeral well, at least he's thinking ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so please, uh, please introduce our guest this week, Winnie. Our guest is Atze de Vrieze of Weird Hit Wonder. Okay, let's start the tape. Atze, welcome. We're glad you could join us here on Metapod to talk about your podcast, Weird Hit Wonder. I'm glad to talk about it. Thank you so much. Welcome. So you're a music journalist in the Netherlands. Uh, you work with the Dutch public broadcasting network, VPRO. Your knowledge and interests in music are, are pretty extensive, I would say. Uh, they cover a lot of ground, uh, and that's whether it's music history and culture to the industry and its business dynamics and for uh, the Netherlands as well as a little bit beyond there globally. You're the host of Weird Hit Wonder, uh, this podcast, which is actually in the Dutch language. Now, in the spirit of Dutch directness and sense of humor, which are two of my favorite things about Dutch culture after living here for 13 years, I'm just going to come out and say... 99% of our listeners probably do not understand any Dutch. Therefore, they probably don't know about Weird Hit Wonder or any other Dutch language podcast for that matter. And and this could actually be the first one that they'll be finding out about. As a matter of fact, Kevin doesn't even know any Dutch language podcasts. All he needed to do to prepare this evening was listen to the five songs (laughs) that I sent him. (laughs) Did you like them, Maya, Kevin? Um... They reminded me a lot of some of the peculiar one-hit wonders that I suspect are universal to many countries with a chart pop music structure. So, um, yes, I thought they were all terrible, and I could relate to many of them <laughs> if that's if that's okay. But we can come back and talk about the kind of the the internationalization of crap pop music later on. We'll uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let Wendy carry on. <laughs> I know I'm failing in my Dutch <laughs> directness here. Anyway, um, let's get to the point. You've got an audience of podcast listeners that don't understand Dutch. And my question is, what can you tell them about Weird Hit Wonder that is going to give them so much FOMO that they're going out and enrolling in <laughs> Dutch language courses tomorrow so that they can listen to your <laughs> podcast? Well, actually, I started doing this podcast because, I mean, we were in COVID, right? Uh, and suddenly everything we were doing and we were loving would, was falling apart. We Usually my job is to jump from one festival to the next and to to cover it, to spread the word, to, to find all the new stuff and all the credible, really good new music. 
and it was all gone. And people were canceling their festival, canceling their gigs. People were postponing their records. And I thought, okay, what is this about? We need some. We need some fun. We need something to laugh about or something that actually reminds you of a certain time in your life. Maybe you don't, don't want to be reminded of that particular song, but once you hear it and you hear the story behind it, you realize there's actually more to it than you ever realized. And that's what basically what Weird Hit Wonder is about. It's about these peculiar hits that you will never ask anyone to play on your funeral or your wedding. It will never be your favorite songs, but there is a certain place in your heart for these peculiar songs. They can be one, one hit wonders, but there's also people who created a, a complete career out of creating these weird songs and over 20 years have scored five or six of them. So I, I, I like these songs, especially when I suspect there's a story behind them that people don't really know. And actually... Most of those songs that you know as Weird Hit Wonders do have these stories. Did you have a sense that there would be enough general or mainstream appeal for such a show? Or do you think that that was something that you could only do since COVID? Well, actually, I, I had this idea before. It was kind of inspired by a Netflix series called uh, The Movies That Made Us. There's actually a, a Netflix series before that that was called The Toys That Made Us. It was actually a brilliant series about the history of toys. It's about He-Man and, and about Barbie and about the Star Wars brand of toys. The characters that you know that you maybe played with when you were young, um, but you don't really know anything about the designers of those toys or how maybe... At first, they were total commercial failures before they conquered the world. And after The Toys That Made Us, which is a lovely series, there was The Movies That Made Us, and it's about 80s and 90s blockbuster movies, about the movies that will never be taken serious by critics. But, you know, you like them. You've seen them. you see them all. Like Home Alone, uh, Die Hard, Ghostbusters, all those movies that everybody knows and, and in a way everybody loves. And so in terms of mainstream appeal, I do know that stories like these are actually appealing to a lot of people because everybody knows these songs. And even though you may have hated the song back in the day, it turns out people like listening to the story behind it and, um, you know, hear something they, I mean, the best compliment I got for this series is, Okay, it's always nice to be surprised by something you didn't know you wanted to know. That's it. Surprising stories. Mm -hmm. Fun stories. Now, you've chosen five songs for the podcast series that are all from the 90s. Yeah. And a, a couple of questions here. Do you feel like you need to know these songs having enjoyed them at the time? Or do you feel like you have a new generation of listeners who are interested to discover weird things like this and the stories behind them? A little bit of both. I think it's nice when you know these songs. I mean, the, th the songs that I chose are all Dutch songs, but there's also, of course, international super hit could be called uh, a weird hit wonder. I mean, when I have to come up with one example of what a weird hit wonder would be, it would be Aqua's Barbie Girl. It, I mean, no one knows why we all love that, but it was a, a worldwide euro pop hit and it was a global success why on earth did we like that i'm i must confess i don't know this you don't know barbie girl you don't know oh, wow. i'm not euro pop <laughs> kevin play it sing it come on i'm a barbie girl in a barbie world life in plastic <laughs> it's fantastic it's so silly you know it's it's amazing and the thing is, these songs... I like the fact that the two men here know the Barbie song and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, actually, what, what I know about the Barbie songs is that uh, a couple of years ago, it was released on Record Store Day, which is usually an annual feast of vinyl fetishists. <laughs> I mean, they release things by the doors and, you know, Rolling Stones and all Pearl Jam. And then there was this pink seven inch version of uh, Barbie Girl by Aqua. And it surprised me that all the people of my generation that I knew were looking for that seven inch. Nobody liked the song. 
but it was just so awful that when it's in your hand and it's an old pink seven inch, you want to have it. So actually, there is a certain aspect of nostalgia. You, you like those songs or you hate those songs more when you know them. But I also heard stories from the people who listened to my podcast who said, I didn't know that song, but I love the the uh, the um, the story behind it. Mm-hmm. For instance, one of the songs that I did is a cafe song. What, how how do you call it? Uh, it's it's a something that that usually doesn't get out of the cafe where people are drunk and singing along. And it's a kind of a naughty song. It's called transsexual in English. Transsexual. It's a it's a strange song because it's it's something that usually stays among drunk people in some weird way. This became a big hit. People didn't know that. And the the stories that I wanted to tell about this song was that there's a whole tradition of songs like that who usually never get into the charts, but they go back decades in the Amsterdam cafe culture. Mm -hmm. And it's nice to tell people about those songs and about the history and about the artists that had kind of their fame with that particular kind of songs. And um, I, I got a lot of response to that song and it's it surprised me kind of because i thought this is the one people really probably don't remember so you don't really have to know them to be grabbed by the story behind them that's uh one song of the five that you've chosen that i thought was particularly or uniquely dutch because it as you said Mm. it's coming from this um dutch tradition yes from the jordan in amsterdam um How how did you what was your process for picking the five songs that are part of this series currently? You know, what what are the criteria for being weird? Oh, that's a good thing. Uh that there, there has to be some kind of humorous aspect to it, I think. But also it's it's kind of a feeling for me. What is weird? I mean, there was this choir of farmers in the early 90s. Um 20 guys from a bar in the east of the Netherlands. They were all kind of farmers. They sang this song together called Moi Mom, which is kind of a chant about, it's it's about the good things in life. And they were a phenomenon in 1991. That's not trash in a way. Barbie girl is trash or transsexual is, is trash. It's It's kind of unique and weird in a sense that it doesn't sound like anything else. So that's kind of something that could qualify as weird as well. But one of the things that I uh, found most important uh, in picking those songs is that I wanted to have the feeling that I could tell something else besides showing the song and how it came about and who wrote it. I wanted to write about kind of a deeper layer behind that story. So the cry of farmers in the early 90s became kind of a symbol of the the countryside versus the city. In interviews, they were always questioned about farmer life and always, you know, farmers, that's probably international. It's, it's probably the same everywhere. People make fun of farmers, especially people in the city who, who think they are way more cool, etc. And, you know, especially in the Netherlands with all the, um, the, the climate change um, Decisions that were made by the government. Farmers are angry and blocking road. You know, mm-hmm. we, we've seen this all year. Angry farmers going to the city, telling the, uh, the the politicians how important they think they are. It's kind of funny to me to tell the story of how a group of farmers from a bar in the east of the Netherlands were embraced by the city back in the early 90s and people loved the fact that they were from the countryside and they, and how they were dancing around with their wooden shoes and making fun of themselves that's that's something i like in that story particularly because there is a connection to how we seen the farmers in the news this year and actually mm-hmm. one of the songs by these farmers became a hit once again this year because the farmers used them as their kind of soundtrack their anthem mm-hmm. for uh, protest mm-hmm. and so that's that's something I, I i search for in a story i want something more to be in this story than just a weird hit because you know you can always go to an opera ski and uh, sing about anton from tyrol or <laughs> stuff like that and if there's no story behind it it's not a 
good song for me to to create a, a podcast about those five that you interviewed or that, or that you focused on yeah um did any of them have a sense that what they were producing at the time was weird or were they do you <laughs> think that they were going for glory albeit very short-lived you know the most of the people i talk to now wrote the song that made them famous in one day <laughs> you know most of the time sometimes it was even a uh, direct they actually tried to make something bad but but <laughs> in yeah, yeah. almost every instance it was a you know you know sometimes you have a good idea right and the next day it doesn't feel like a good idea anymore these songs are the good ideas that are actually turned into songs yeah and uh you know it went so fast that they couldn't think about it mostly you know maybe 20 years later i mean you you never get rid of a song like that it's it's attached to your life forever even though most people do realize why I call them weird hit wonders are still proud of them. It's their song. It's, it's their, it's, it's their signature thing they did in life. And actually they probably had a good time as well for that year, because when you have a hit like that, yeah. you can like tour the country, you go to all the holiday places and do five gigs in a weekend for a lot of money. And you think, <laughs> what the hell is happening to me? Yeah. And it lasts a year, and after that, I mean, it disappears into history, and you think, okay, what happened there? You haven't considered leaving your day job and doing this? Me, creating hits like that? Yeah, N not yet. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a twisted mind like that, that I come up with <laughs> a weird idea. <laughs> but, you know, I, 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 kind of, I kind of like the fact that several people I talked to in this series who created a hit, I mean, they realized they were making something really stupid. They they did it on purpose. They created something stupid. They ended up in a kind of whirlwind of success and they enjoyed it. And mm -hmm. maybe they think, what happened there? I like that. I, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know how you would define hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, here in the UK, it would be, you know, got to number one in the charts or something like that but did any of the five actually make any serious money from their albeit brief stardom uh well actually most most of these hits were actual hits in terms of chart success like these farmers from yeah. the east of the netherlands they were in the charts for the whole year with with that song with several songs actually they had gold records for it oh wow uh, you know, the, the fact <laughs> is they were uh, a bunch of 20 guys. So who, who would get the money, right? Uh, they were friends and they decided early on, they said, okay, we are going to earn money from this. What are we going to do? We don't want to fight over this money. We, we're going to spend it together. So actually what they did was they bought a giant balloon, a flying balloon. It was 40 meters long in the shape of a cow. And actually, that's kind of a Spinal Tap story because it was created by uh, someone who ordered it, but it was um, it was <laughs> it was designed in centimeters, and it was created in inches, so it was way too big. <laughs> the guy who initially ordered that balloon in the shape of a cow didn't want it, um, so they bought it for a nice price, and they said, "You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna travel to all the balloon festivals in the world, to Switzerland, to Egypt, to the UK." We're going to travel with all our friends and our wives, and we're going to spend our money on hotels and have dinner together, you know, create balloon holidays <laughs> and never, never fight over money. And they succeeded. They actually still have some money left from that period in time. It's almost 30 years ago by now. There's still some money left. I mean, some of these farmer, farmers have moved to uh, the United States, for instance, or have done something completely different. But every once in a while they come together, they have a meeting, all the drinks are paid for, everybody's celebrating their uh, friendship every, every once in a while. And they look back on a nice period in their lives. But yeah, actually, uh, some of the other people have actually really made money. So the guy with the transsexual song, he created this funny, little bit dirty song and, you know, this guy had been working in bars for over 10 years. That was his career. He was working in bars. He started at eight and he went home at two or three in the morning. He played nonstop. 
And now he could do four gigs in a night in different places in the country, which paid him a lot more than he used to get paid for playing a whole night nonstop. You know, when you have this song, that's also when you create a good song, of course, a, a good one hit wonder. Also weird hit wonders, they stay alive. You have these re retro festivals. People like to go to these 90s fests and hear Barbie Girl. You know, Aqua, yep. the Danish act who created Barbie yeah. Girl, are still playing. And actually, <laughs> of the four original members of Aqua, three are still in the group. That's interesting, right? You can play forever with this one song people remember from 1993. Interesting, Aqua didn't have any kind of creative differences or problems, you know, second album syndrome or anything like that, you know, <laughs> classic music career problems. Uh, I, you know, they may have. <laughs> I think these are pretty weird songs. I, I think there, in general, it can be some pretty weird Dutch songs if you translate them to English. I translated these roughly for Kevin and then told him about actually the 2019 song of the year. Uh -huh. Uh, Meryl, how you back in Bethma, uh -huh. which is roughly translates as "shut up and lick my pussy." <laughs> there you go. That was song of the year was. Uh, I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> that was the song of the year that our our listeners voted for. Yeah, it's kind of a funny modern feminist humorist song. I kind of liked it. But it was really surprising that people massively voted for it to be the song of the year. Of course, really, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> It wasn't a hit in terms of chart success, though, but it was uh, a song that most people knew last year. I, I'm, I'm not surprised, given the title, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a specific kind of weird hit wonder, which are the sexual weird hits. People liked them because they were so sexual that you like to sing along in a bar. There was this... Out Here Brothers song in the 90s called I Want to Fuck You in the Ass. Yeah, that, that was the title. And it was also the chorus. That was what you sang in the bar. It was kind of a rap electronic song. And it was, a, it was kind of a big hit worldwide. It's crazy. It, people just liked it because it was so explicit. Do you find that Dutch? And that's an American song. It's, it's something that's international. I don't, I don't know if this, you know, this song that last year became our song of the year, if it's typical, typical Dutch, I don't know. A lot of people in the Netherlands found it really weird and tasteless as well. It's not like everybody thinks this is a normal kind of song, but actually it's not that, I mean, it's humorous. It's humorous. It's, it has a nice video as well. I love it. Did you hear the song, Kevin? Did you like it? I, I dread to, I, I dread to think how you I I, <laughs> I dread to think what kind of a video accompanies that song, I must say. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's satire, who knows? It is, in a way, yeah. Yeah. You've said in interviews in for Dutch media that you really enjoy humorous and funny stories. And I imagine you hear a lot of them being a music journalist from both you know, maybe the consumer side and the business side, but there are other emotions you must discover in doing your research. But, you know, what are those? And was there anything you didn't include in the podcast that maybe you should have or considered it, but then decided not to? No, well, actually, there, there's no things I find important and I didn't include in the podcast. But, you know, for instance, the transsexual song that uh, I mentioned before, it, it got boycotted back in the day. It got a boycott on radio. People didn't want to play it anymore because it, they found it tasteless. And also the, the singer, Ronald, who I interviewed, of course, for the series, he told me that back in the day, there were some threats to him. You know, the song is about a man who works in a brothel dressed up as a, as a woman. And it's, it's, it's nothing much more than that. It's just a funny thing. It's, it rhymes. There's not much to it, actually. But, you know, when you were a transgender person back in the day, and every time you went into the bar, you stepped into your favorite bar, People would put on that song. Of course, that hurts. This guy actually got some threats as well. And he told me a story that one time he actually had to perform in a bulletproof vest because people said, we're going to shoot you off the stage. And his manager said, of course, you're going to perform. I'll send security guys with you. Uh, you. You wear a vest. And, you know, it's it's crazy when you hear when you hear that, right? 
It's just a song. It's funny. He didn't think about it really. Maybe he would hurt people by it, but he did. And of course, it's it's strange to realize that actually this kind of anger comes from a goofy bar song that kind of got out of hand. That's basically what it is, right? And, uh, you know, another one of the other that I um, talked about in this series is a, a bubbling song, which is actually a Caribbean kind of style of music, usually created by people... Uh, from uh, the Antilles on the other side of the planet but there's a, a big history of course those were uh, part of the Netherlands in the colonial age uh, they still are actually but the people from the Antilles came over to the to to Holland to create to bring with them this music and they struggled to make some money with it and then a couple of years later there was this white guy from not from their scene who created a giant hit and actually, he kind of got some ideas that he heard in other songs, you know. So that's something else that created anger. It's kind of a mm. cultural appropriation story in that song. And um, that kind of stories are in there often. And actually, most of the songs, well, let's put it differently, the most interesting Weird Hit Wonders have these kind of aspects as well. They make people angry in a way. You know, I, I also um, talked about this song called uh, Alles naar de Klote, which is everything fucked up. Two guys making fun of the upcoming gubber scene, hardcore scene in the Netherlands. And there's this hint, a kind of joke, a pun towards uh, an upcoming hooligan rivalry between uh, Ajax and Feyenoord here in the Netherlands. And that actually became a much bigger thing during the years that followed in the hardcore scene, where football hooligans would hurt the scene. They went to the parties, they spoiled the atmosphere, they spoiled the image of the whole scene. And that was an aspect that was already in that song, which was a pioneering hardcore Gabber song in 1992. And it was something that pointed us forward to what was about to come in the coming years. So those emotions and those aspects of these fun songs, I like the most. All five songs that you've chosen are performed by men. They're probably were produced by men. Is it safe to say that Dutch men have a special gift for creating shit? <laughs> or, I mean, maybe you have the all-female version coming up next season. No, well, actually, I'm, I'm working on a new season. And I must say that you are pretty much right that these songs, there, there's a lot of men working on these crazy things, especially behind the scenes. I mean, of course, when you know the song you don't realize who's behind it who's right. putting it out who's the a and r manager who created how to give advice to a shit song like that <laughs> but you know there of course once again i want to mention barbie girl who is big on my list to be on my second season i'm looking outside the dutch borders i i hope to get in contact with them one of the the people i'm in contact with now is also rednecks from sweden who had this bonkers hit called cotton eye joe it was a combination of yeah. country music, American folk with Euro, Euro trash dance music. It's oh, it's a, it's a, such a strange song, and it was a worldwide hit, also in the United States, where they were flirting with uh, with uh, American styles of music, and the Americans, surprisingly enough, didn't think, "What the hell is yeah. this?" They liked it, and people still like this song. Turns out to be a, a, a TikTok hit nowadays. And TikTok is, of course, a, an interesting phenomenon uh, in terms of weird hit wonders because <laughs> you get a whole new generation of weird songs or maybe even weird 20 seconds or 15 seconds of songs because you want to have something yeah, weird exactly. uh, on your TikTok because it's it's nice, it's fun, you can, it, it makes you laugh. That's what whole, the whole TikTok phenomenon is about. You know, so I think there's some woman vocalists in the wish list that i have for my second season I, I i'm quite interested in just the phenomenon of not only one hit wonders but kind of manufactured pop and bands that are manufactured and you kind of spoke to it a little bit mm. then when you're talking about advice from managers and a and r men and i wonder how many of those five that you focused on now kind of came through that record company machine or whether like the farmers that that would that, if you pardon the pun more of an organic kind of uh, more of an organic way of creating a song uh, actually most of these songs are kind of organic funnily enough um yeah but there's also 
almost in every instance, there is a record company that believes in that song and puts it out and puts it into the machine. Yeah. Uh, one of the songs that I talk about is about the machine, though. It's about, um, the song is called One Day Fly. It's by an ex called One Day Fly. And it's actually the result of a cabaret TV show in the Netherlands back in the day. It was created in 2001. And it was a response to a phenomenon that we all know and all seen about uh, around the world, which is the TV talent shows yeah. like... Um, X Factor and The Voice and you know there was this TV show called Star Maker in 2001 which was actually more or less the first big talent show that we had in the Netherlands and it was about I think seven or eight young people like 19 20 years old who were put in a big brother house you know cameras 24 yeah. hours in the house you know they were supposed to be in there for eight or 12 weeks and they were all going through the process of becoming a group, manufactured pop group like the Backstreet Boys, for instance, who were big back in the day, uh, with help of industry people, A&R managers, marketeers, and they would create a number one hit. And they did. And these people in this, this TV show, which was a weekly Saturday night show where a lot of people, millions of people were watching that every Saturday night. And they said, you know, this is bullshit. This is manufactured pop. This is rubbish this is a shame we should do something something about it and what we are going to do is we are going to create a bad song and we are going to prove that it <laughs> is not special what they did we can create a hit as well and they did they went to number one yeah. as well for about four weeks uh, it's actually a horrible song it sounds kind of <laughs> like a robbie williams song but sung bad with horrible lyrics <laughs> It was supposed to be bad, you know. It was to prove the talent show that everybody was watching and applauding to be wrong. But the fun funny thing about that story is you create something as a joke and you end up in a fame circus yourself because people were yeah. were cheering for them. They wanted autographs. People wanted their their dog to have an autograph on its back, you know. And, and actually, they became <laughs> jealous of each other because there was three guys who were asked to be in a photo shoot and the other guys in the group said hey what about me you had to remind yourself being in that group it was all a joke that's a funny dynamic yeah and that's about manufactured pop you know uh especially in the 90s there was this big distinction between commercial pop and alternative pop i think that kind of disappeared by now because it's okay when you're a credible music lover to say Katy Perry or Carly Rae Jepsen is actually great pop music or The Weeknd really rocks. Of course you can say that. There's no one who thinks anything else. But if you would like R&B music in the 90s or Backstreet Boys or Britney Spears kind of manufactured pop music, that wasn't okay. That was commercial shit, right? Yeah. And it was actually, yeah. looking back, it was kind of quality manufactured pop music that actually yeah. stands the test of time, most of it, some of it, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think some people disagree, but I think a lot of people say that the first properly manufactured boy band, for example, was the Monkees. Oh, yeah. Out of the US, which was in response to, you know, the Beatles from the UK. And and they came up with some great, you know, they had some great tunes, whether they wrote them or not. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a, an, a monkey. I'm not a, an aficionado. Mike Nesmith is brilliant. Right. So, but they were a manufactured band. So it's not like it's a new, it's not like it's a new phenomenon. Yeah. You know, you, you can say the same for the whole, the whole Motown history is full of manufactured groups who didn't write their own songs. I mean, actually we have to remind ourselves that before the sixties, it wasn't normal to re record yes. your own songs at all. It was very normal for songwriters in big buildings to write the songs who were performed by several artists and maybe se sometimes even several artists scored hits with the same song in the same year. That was really normal. You know, the whole hit factory of Motown, which is now seen as some of the very best pop music that was ever made, was a factory where songwriters were mixed with studio musicians and manufactured boy or girl groups who were actually really, really good. We can say that, especially looking back 40 or 50 years now. Sometimes it takes 
time to realize that it doesn't really matter whether it's commercial. It's just good music or not good music. There's a lot of great commercial or slick music from the 80s that is reevaluated through our ears of today. And actually, we, we live in an interesting time where most of the things I hated back in the day in the early 90s have been reevaluated and sometimes it's even flipped i used to like pearl jam back in the day and pearl jam is actually by a lot of people my generation i'm 40 years old a lot of people of my generation think of pearl jam as the best band of the world i mean they're still performing they're still and they're lauding their they're applauding their three hour live shows and it's always different and it's real craftsmanship and they still create great albums you know i hate this band <laughs> And I like music that I really hated in the early 90s. Sometimes I like it now. It's strange, right? How time changes that. Maybe it's... What was wrong with the 90s? There's nothing wrong with the 90s. I, I love a lot of 90s. <laughs> I grew up in the 90s. Uh, and um, there's a lot of stuff I liked in the 90s that I still like. And there's also stuff that I hated and now like or the other way around. That's interesting. About these weird hit wonders, I, w I will not play... Barbie girl at my funeral. Of course I won't. But I <laughs> You might you might not have any choice. Someone else might play. You might you won't be able to do anything about it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, when we move on and we are in this situation where every song in the history of pop music is available, you can use them in different ways. You can just play something for the fun of it. Whereas in the nineties yeah. you would only have a when you would be stupid to buy a record that you hated, right? Why would you? Why would you spend money on a song that you didn't like? <laughs> but now... it's a very good point. You can actually, yep. at a party in your home, we're in COVID situation, right? We cannot go to clubs. Some people have small parties at their homes. You can play a, a funny song from the 90s that you used to hate. Now maybe in the situation where people have drank something, suddenly everybody likes it. That's a strange situation, but it happens. And it has something to do with the total availability of music as well. One, one thing that's been very interesting, and this won't be the first time I'm sure in the history of Metapod that I mentioned Depeche Mode on this podcast, because they are my favorite band, but certainly in the UK throughout the 80s and the early 90s, they were often heavily criticized by the music press for, for many, many reasons. And what was very interesting in the early 2000s, is most of those music critics from the 80s and the 90s had gone on to do other things, probably move into public relations or something, or, you know, got other proper jobs. And this new kind of generation of music critics came along and suddenly thought, oh, actually, these, these guys are really good. And then the band always found that quite surprising that the, all of a sudden they, they, you know, 20 years into their career, they're starting to be critically acclaimed back in the country that was kind of very critical of them in the 80s for being, you know, a bit too poppy and a bit too th synthy. But, you know, a generation of critics move on and the next ones come along and they actually like them. You know, if, if I may, about the Depeche Mode story, yeah, yeah. I heard an interview with Anton Corbijn the other day. It was two weeks ago mm -hmm. on a Dutch radio show. And he said he hated the band as well. I mean, he's known, of course, for <laughs> a long-term yeah. relationship with the band. He created. Uh, the image for the band, press pics, you know, cover album covers, uh, stage design for their tours. I mean, you, you you should say he's a big fan. But back in the day, mm -hmm. in the early days, he worked for the NME, and he thought they were manufactured pop, trash, a boy band, you know. But there's a, especially the synth pop of the early '80s has been reevaluated heavily. A new wave music and synth pop, which was um, often seen as manufactured pop back in the day, now is uh, critically acclaimed and played on the dance floor a lot as well by by credible DJs all the time. Just as Italo disco, which is all we weird hit wonders all over, right? Some of these songs are so strange, and the stranger they are, the better they sometimes work on a dance floor. Yeah. So one last one for me. And um, do you think a podcast? that looks at just one hit wonders that are actually good would be as interesting to listeners as weird hit wonders. And the reason why I say that, because I was, while we were talking, I was looking on what were some of the, uh, the biggest one hit wonders in the UK charts of all time. 
and it's actually one of my favorite songs is on there pump up the volume by mars oh yeah may... yeah and that was a one hit wonder and you know it's probably quite an interesting story but i wonder whether it fits into whether it needs to be weird in order to be interesting um actually i know a tv series called single luck that was made in the 90s which was about one hit wonders uh, and they weren't some of them were weird like kung fu fighting for instance was in there <laughs> some of them were actually i mean it could be about pump up the volume as well and i actually think it would be nice to tell these stories but um at the same time, I like the appeal of the weirdness and about the fact that you are dragging people into yeah. listening to song stories about songs they don't really like or actually hate. Uh, I like the appeal of that, but of course, you could make a great series of interesting stories about one-hit wonders that are actually good. Yeah, Absolutely. So I think I'll start to wrap it up here, but... Um... We're recording this at the end of 2020. I know that you have another podcast called The Machina, mm -hmm. which uh, you co-host, and that's more industry focused. Yeah. Um, so I thought we'd just kind of ask for your insight on uh, what you think some of the biggest issues will be for the music industry in the coming year or so without choosing COVID-19. <laughs> You know, everything is, is now so much attached to that, of course. Mm. You know, what I what I do think is um, what I like about this year, and there's a lot of things to hate about this year, especially when you're in the business of promoting a festival or promoting a band that's on tour. That's total shit, you know. What I think it's interesting about this year is that it also brings a kind of a new creativity toward what you're going to do with your music. What are you going to create? Uh, and you see that a lot of interesting things are happening in theaters, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of solo performances uh, on on stage or uh, hybrid forms of theater where you, I mean, just put on a webcam and play some songs on the piano is not really that interesting, right? We are not going to watch that. I mean, we lose our attention pretty quick. But there's also big artists like Billie Eilish or, um, or or Dua Lipa who are trying to create a kind of momentum through a screen, uh, but also creating something that you actually want to see. This something that will bring new ideas that we can build upon after COVID. At some point, there will be a vaccine and we will be able to be on a field of grass with a big stage and fall into each other's arms and enjoy music the way it's supposed to be enjoyed. But there is also, you know, there's new ideas and that's, that's nice to focus on. So, you know, for me personally, this year wasn't that terrible. There's, there's creativity mm -hmm. and Apart from the fact that a lot of people are losing their jobs, which is terrible, it's also an interesting year. There's a lot to tell. Do you have any festival tickets for next year? <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's actually my job to go to a lot of festivals. So <laughs> terrible job. It's a terrible job. Actually, it's it's not. Of course, it's 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 fantastic to be in all these places. At the same time, I must admit, it's it's also kind of a relief to have a festival this year. And I'm looking forward to have festivals next year. Well, listeners, I think you should go and sign up for your Dutch language courses tomorrow morning so that you can have a listen to <laughs> Weird Hit Wonder. You can also just look at, listen to the songs. Right. So, yeah, you'll you'll want to listen to Atze de Frieze of Weird Hit Wonder. Thank you so much, Atze, for coming. Just talk to us on Metapod. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thanks very much, or thank you well, to Atze de Frieza for talking to us on Metapod about Weird Hit Wonder. Yeah, I mean, really all I want to know, Wendy, is did you get a chance to listen to Barbie Girl yet? <laughs> yes. And? And I think it's almost like Kylie Minogue joined Bananarama. Okay, and... I won't have a bad word said about Kylie Minogue, to be fair. Nor Bananarama, I hope. <laughs> I, I'm really hoping that Atza is able to talk to Aqua for the second season of Weird Hit Wonder. So Atza, maybe you could get at the story behind Ken's hair in the video. Thank you in advance. I'm not so sure about it and I would really love to hear that story. Okay, you can uh, follow Atza on Twitter at Atza DeVries. You can just follow the link that we'll put on the story that accompanies this particular episode and you can find one hit wonder and the songs that are featured in the podcast on the internet at mporadio2.nl or on your favorite major podcast platform
Also, of course, we love fan mail. So let us know what you think of Metapod and your recommendations for podcasts that you'd like to see featured on Metapod. You can also contact us at metapodshow.com. That's it for now. We'll see you next time. That's it for Metapod this time. Thanks for listening. Metapod will be back soon with another unpacking of the web's most interesting podcasts. But in the meantime, make sure to subscribe at any of the usual places you find your other favourite podcasts. We'd hate for you to miss upcoming episodes, and we'd love it if you left us a review. You can let us know what you think of this episode by going to metapodshow.com. We'll see you next time. Metapod is produced by Wendy Morrill and Kevin May.